Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a night of historic broadcasting. Tonight we bring you a rebroadcast of Orson Welles's iconic War of the Worlds, a radio drama that stirred the nation on that fateful October evening in 1938. In a unique twist, we have harnessed the power of artificial intelligence to recreate the voices of some of the most legendary figures in broadcasting history. As the story unfolds, you will hear the unmistakable voice of Walter Cronkite delivering the urgent news bulletins that once gripped listeners with fear and fascination. Joining him, the incomparable William Shatner, with a slight British accent, takes on the role of Carl Phillips, the relentless reporter on the scene. Orson Welles himself returns as Professor Pearson, lending his dramatic gravitas to this thrilling tale. And in a delightful twist, the legendary Johnny Carson steps into the shoes of Mr. Wilmoth, bringing his unique charm to the bewildered witness of the alien invasion. To avoid any copyright issues, we have also replaced all the original music with compositions generated by artificial intelligence, ensuring a fresh yet respectful homage to the original production. So sit back, relax, and prepare yourself for a journey back in time. Let your imagination run wild as we present to you a faithful recreation of War of the Worlds, enhanced with the voices of broadcasting legends. This is a night you won't soon Columbia forget. Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theatre and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small spinning fragment of solar driftwood which by chance or design man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the thirty-ninth year of the twentieth century came the great disillusionment, it was near the end of October. Business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crosley service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radios. For the next 24 hours, not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain, accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We now take you to the Meridian Room in the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8, Central Time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving towards the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, 
like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel, situated in downtown New York. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on the event. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. We are now ready to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, or commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. I am standing in a large semicircular room, pitch black, except for an oblong split in the ceiling. Through this opening, I can see a sprinkling of stars that cast a kind of frosty glow over the intricate mechanism of the huge telescope. The ticking sound you hear is the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through a giant lens. I ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise during our interview. Besides his ceaseless watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or other communications. During this period, he is in constant touch with the astronomical centers of the world. Professor, may I begin our questions? At any time, Mr. Phillips. Professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A red disk swimming in a blue sea transverse stripes across the disk. Quite distinct now because Mars happens to be the point nearest the Earth. In opposition, as we call it. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, Professor Pearson? Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips, although that's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to the planet. Then you're quite convinced as a scientist that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars. I'd say the chances against it are a thousand to one. And yet how do you account for those gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Mr. Phillips, I cannot account for it. By the way, Professor, for the benefit of our listeners, how far is Mars from Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. Well, that seems a safe enough distance. Thank you. Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has just handed Professor Pearson a message. While he reads it, let me remind you that we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer, Professor Pearson. One moment, please. Professor Pearson has passed me a message which he has just received. Professor, may I read the message to the listening audience? Certainly, Mr. Phillips. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you a wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray of the National History Museum, New York. 9.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Seismograph registered shock of almost earthquake intensity occurring within a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate. Signed, Lloyd Gray, Chief of Astronomical Division. Professor Pearson. Could this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? Hardly, Mr. Phillips. This is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past ten minutes we've been speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton, bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York studio. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Toronto, Canada, Professor Morse of McGill University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now nearer home comes a special announcement from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object believed to be a meteorite fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word description as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millette and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. We take you now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again at the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I... I hardly know where to begin. To paint for you a word picture of the strange scene before my eyes, like something out of a modern Arabian Nights. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. I guess that's it. Yes, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me, half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree it must have struck on its way down. What I can see of the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor, at least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. It has a diameter of... What would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? What would you say? What is the diameter? About 30 yards. About 30 yards? The metal on the sheath is... Well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish white. Curious spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. They're getting in front of my line of vision. Would you mind standing to one side, please? One side there, one side. While the policemen are pushing the crowd back, here's Mr. Wilmoth, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmoth, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard? Step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmoth. Well, I was listening to the radio. Closer and louder, please. Pardon me? Louder, please, and closer. Well, I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsing that that professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half dozing and half... Yes, yes, Mr. Wilmoth. Then what happened? As I was saying, I was listening to the radio kind of half ways. <laughs> yes, Mr. Wilmoth. And then you saw something? Not first off. I heard something. And, and what did you hear? A hissing sound, like this. <sniffs> kind of like a Fourth of July rocket. Then what? Turned my head out the window and would have swore I was to sleep and dreaming. Yes? I seen a kind of greenish streak, and then zingo! Something smacked the ground, knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmoth? Well, I... I ain't quite sure. I reckon I... I was kind of riled. Thank you, Mr. Wilmoth. Thank you. Want me to tell you some more? No. That's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmoth owner of the farm where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us. Police are trying to rope off the roadway leading to the farm. But it's no use. They're breaking right through. Cars headlights throw an enormous spot on the pit where the object's half buried. Some of the more daring souls are now venturing near the edge. Their silhouettes stand out against the metal sheen. One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with a policeman. The policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but now it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll move the microphone nearer. Now we're not more than 25 feet away. Can you hear it now? Oh, Professor Pearson. Yes, Mr. Phillips. Can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial, not found on this earth. 
Friction with the Earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and, as you can see, of cylindrical shape. But just a minute. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw. The thing must be hollow. She's moving! Look! The darn thing's unscrewing! Keep back there! Keep back, I tell you! Maybe there's men in it trying to escape! It's red hot! They'll burn to a cinder! Keep back there! Keep those idiots back! She's off! The top's loose! Look out there! Stand back! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone's crawling out of the hollow top. Someone or something. I can see peering out of that black hole two luminous disks. Are they eyes? It might be a face. It might be... Good heaven, something's wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another. They look like tentacles to me. There I can see the thing's body. It's large, large as a bear, and it glistens like wet leather. But that face, it... Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The eyes are black and gleam like a serpent. The mouth is V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. The monster, or whatever it is, can hardly move. It seems weighed down by... possibly gravity or something. The thing's raising up. The crowd falls back now. They've seen plenty. This is the most extraordinary experience. I can't find words. I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description until I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. bringing you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. We now return you to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmoth's garden. From here I get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk, as long as I can see. More state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit, about 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain is conferring with someone. We can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now they've parted. The professor moves around one side, studying the object, while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole, a flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait, something's happening. shape is rising out of the pit, I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. 
What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror, and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Good Lord, they're turning to flame. Now, the whole field's caught on fire. The woods, the barns, the gas tanks of automobiles, it's spreading everywhere. It's coming this way. About 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Indel Koffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We now continue with our piano interlude. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been handed a message that came in from Grover's Mill by telephone. Just a moment. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of the village of Grover's Mill, their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. The next voice you hear will be that of Brigadier General Montgomery Smith, commander of the state militia at Trenton, New Jersey. I have been requested by the governor of New Jersey to place the counties of Mercer and Middlesex as far west as Princeton and east to Jamesburg under martial law. No one will be permitted to enter this area except by special pass issued by state or military authorities. Four companies of state militia are proceeding from Trenton to Grover's Mill and will aid in the evacuation of homes within the range of military operations. Thank you. You have just been listening to General Montgomery Smith commanding the state militia at Trenton. In the meantime, further details of the catastrophe at Grover's Mill are coming in. The strange creatures, after unleashing their deadly assault, crawled back into their pit and made no attempt to prevent the efforts of the firemen to recover the bodies and extinguish the fire. Combined fire departments of Mercer County are fighting the flames which menace the entire countryside. We have been unable to establish any contact with our mobile unit at Grover's Mill, but we hope to be able to return you there at the earliest possible moment. In the meantime, we take you... Just one moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been informed that we have finally established communication with an eyewitness of the tragedy. Professor Pearson has been located at a farmhouse near Grover's Mill, where he has established an emergency observation post. As a scientist, he will give you his explanation of the calamity. The next voice you hear will be that of Professor Pearson, brought to you by direct wire. Professor Pearson. Of the creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grover's Mill, I can give you no authoritative information, either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. Of their destructive instrument, I might venture some conjectural explanation. For want of a better term, I shall refer to the mysterious weapon as a heat ray. It's all too evident that these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. It is my guess that in some way they are able to generate an intense heat in a chamber of practically absolute non-conductivity. This intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. That is my conjecture of the origin of the heat ray. Thank you, Professor Pearson. 
Ladies and gentlemen, here is a bulletin from Trenton. It is a brief statement informing us that the charred body of Carl Phillips has been identified in a Trenton hospital. Now here's another bulletin from Washington, D.C. Office of the Director of the National Red Cross reports, 10 units of Red Cross emergency workers have been assigned to the headquarters of the state militia stationed outside Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Here's a bulletin from state police, Princeton Junction. The fires at Grover's Mill and vicinity are now under control. Scouts report all quiet in the pit and no sign of life appearing from the mouth of the cylinder. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special statement from Mr. Harry McDonald, Vice President in Charge of Operations. We have received a request from the militia at Trenton to place at their disposal our entire broadcasting facilities. In view of the gravity of the situation and believing that radio has a responsibility to serve in the public interest at all times, we are turning over our facilities to the state militia at Trenton. We take you now to the field headquarters of the state militia near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. This is Captain Lansing of the Signal Corps, attached to the state militia, now engaged in military operations in the vicinity of Grover's Mill. Situation arising from the reported presence of certain individuals of unidentified nature is now under complete control. The cylindrical object which lies in a pit directly below our position is surrounded on all sides by eight battalions of infantry without heavy field pieces, but adequately armed with rifles and machine guns. All cause for alarm, if such cause ever existed, is now entirely unjustified. The things, whatever they are, do not even venture to poke their heads above the pit. I can see their hiding place plainly in the glare of the searchlights here. With all their reported resources, these creatures can scarcely stand up against heavy machine gun fire. Anyway, it's an interesting outing for the troops. I can make out their khaki uniforms crossing back and forth in front of the lights. It looks almost like a real war. There appears to be some slight smoke in the woods bordering the Millstone River, probably fire started by campers. Well, we ought to see some action soon. One of the companies is deploying on the left flank and quick thrust and it will all be over. Now, wait a minute. I see something on top of the cylinder. No, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmoth Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on an old metal tube. Wait, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving, solid metal, a kind of shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and higher. Why it's standing on legs act actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. Hold on! Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle which took place tonight at Grover's Mill has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by any army in modern times. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns pitted against a single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors. The rest strewn over the battle area from Grover's Mill to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster, or burned to cinders by its heat ray. The monster is now in control of the middle section of New Jersey and has effectively cut the state through its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Railroad tracks are torn and service from New York to Philadelphia discontinued except routing some of the trains through Allentown and Phoenixville. Highways to the north, south, and west are clogged with frantic human traffic. Police and army reserves are unable to control the mad flight. By morning, the fugitives will have swelled Philadelphia, Camden, and Trenton, it is estimated, to twice their normal population. At this time, martial law prevails throughout New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. We take you now to Washington for a special broadcast on the national emergency with the Secretary of the Interior. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you, uh, private citizens and public officials, all of you, the urgent need of calm and resourceful action. 
Fortunately, this formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area, and we may place our faith in the military forces to keep them there. In the meantime, placing our faith in God, we must continue the performance of our duties, each and every one of us, so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous, and consecrated to the preservation of human supremacy on this earth. I thank you. You have just heard the Secretary of the Interior speaking from Washington. Bulletins too numerous to read are piling up in the studio here. We are informed the central portion of New Jersey is blacked out from radio communication due to the effect of the heat ray upon power lines and electrical equipment. Here is a special bulletin from New York. Cables received from English, French, German scientific bodies offering assistance. Astronomers report continued gas outbursts at regular intervals on planet Mars. Majority voice opinion that enemy will be reinforced by additional rocket machines. Attempts made to locate Professor Pearson of Princeton, who has observed Martians at close range. It is feared he was lost in recent battle. Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report three Martian machines visible above treetops, moving north towards Somerville, with population fleeing ahead of them. Heat ray, not in use, although advancing at express train speed, invaders pick their way carefully. They seem to be making conscious effort to avoid destruction of cities and countryside. However, they stop to uproot power lines, bridges, and railroad tracks. Their apparent objective is to crush resistance, paralyze communication, and disorganize human society. Here is a bulletin from Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Coon hunters have stumbled on a second cylinder similar to the first embedded in the Great Swamp 20 miles south of Morristown. Army field pieces are proceeding from Newark to blow up second invading unit before cylinder can be opened and the fighting machine rigged. They are taking up position in the foothills of Watching Mountains. Another bulletin from Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report enemy machines, now three in number, increasing speed northward, kicking over houses and trees in their evident haste to form a conjunction with their allies south of Morristown. Machines also sighted by telephone operator east of Middlesex within 10 miles of Plainfield. Here's a bulletin from Winston Field, Long Island. Fleet of army bombers carrying heavy explosives flying north in pursuit of enemy. Scouting planes act as guides. They keep speeding enemy in sight. Just a moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run special wires to the artillery line in adjacent villages to give you direct reports in the zone of the advancing enemy. First, we take you to the battery of the 22nd Field Artillery located in the Watchtongue Mountains. Range 32 meters. 32 meters. Projection 39 degrees. 39 degrees. Fire! One hundred and forty yards to the right, sir! Shift range, 31 meters. 31 meters! Projection, 37 degrees. 37 degrees! Fire! A hit, sir. We got the tripod of one of them. They've stopped. The others are trying to repair it. Quick, get the range. Shift 30 meters. 30 meters. Projection, 27 degrees. 27 degrees. Fire! Can't see the shell land, sir. They're letting off a smoke. What is it? A black smoke, sir, moving this way, lying close to the ground. It's moving fast. Put on gas mask. Get ready to fire. Shift 24 meters. 24 meters. Projection, 24 degrees. 24 degrees. Fire! The smoke's coming nearer. Get the range. 23 meters. 23 meters. 23 meters. Projection 22 degrees. 22 degrees. 
Army bombing plane V-843 off Bayonne, New Jersey, Lieutenant Vaught, commanding eight bombers. Reporting to Commander Fairfax, Langham Field. This is Vaught, reporting to Commander Fairfax, Langham Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight, reinforced by three machines from the Morristown Cylinder. Six altogether. One machine already crippled, believed hit by shell from army gun in Wachung Mountains. Guns now appear silent, a heavy black fog hanging close to the earth. Of extreme density, nature unknown, no sign of heat ray. Enemy now turns east, crossing Passaic River into the Jersey marshes. Another straddles the Pulaski Skyway. Evident objective is New York City. They're pushing down a high-tension power station. The machines are close together now, and we're ready to attack. Planes circling, ready to strike. A thousand yards, and we'll be over the first. Eight hundred yards. Six hundred. Four hundred. Two hundred. There they go. The giant arm raised. Green flesh! They're spraying us with flame. Two thousand feet, engines are giving out. No chance to release bombs, only one thing left. Drop on them, plane and all. We're diving on the first one. Now the engine's gone, eight. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. This is Bayonne, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. This is Langham Field. Go ahead. Eight Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. Engines incapacitated by heat ray. All crashed. One enemy machine destroyed. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in direction of... This is Newark, New Jersey. This is Newark, New Jersey. Warning, poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street, gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over Raymond Boulevard. 2X2L, calling CQ, 2X2L, calling CQ. 2X2L, calling 8X3R. Come in, please. This is 8X3R. It's coming back at 2X2L. How's reception? How's reception? K, please. Where are you, 8X3R? What's the matter? Where are you? I'm speaking from the roof of the broadcasting building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimated in last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchison River Parkway still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island. Hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed ten minutes ago. No more defenses. Our army wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here to the end. People are holding service below us in the cathedral. Now I look down the harbor, all manner of boats, overloaded with fleeing population, pulling out from docks. Streets are all jammed, noise in crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute, enemy now in sight above the palisades. Five, five great machines. First one is crossing river. I can see it from here, wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. A bulletin's handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis, seem to be timed and spaced. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. His steel, cowlish head is even with the skyscrapers. He waits for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is the end now. Smoke comes out. Black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running towards the East River. 
thousands of them, dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue, 100 yards away. It's 50 feet. 2X2L calling CQ. New York, is there anyone out there? 2X2L. As I set down these notes on paper, I'm obsessed by the thought that I may be the last living man on earth. I have been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seems part of another life, a life that has no continuity with the present furtive existence of the lonely derelict who pencils these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Pearson. I look down at my blackened hands, my torn shoes, my tattered clothes, and I try to connect them with a professor who lives at Princeton, and who on the night of October 30th glimpsed through his telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, my books, my observatory, my... my world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? In writing down my daily life, I tell myself, shall preserve human history between the dark covers of this little book that was meant to record the movements of the stars. But to write I must live, and to live I must eat. I find moldy bread in the kitchen and an orange not too spoiled to swallow. I keep watch at the window. From time to time I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. The smoke still holds the house in its black coil, but at length there is a hissing sound, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on his machine, spraying the air with a jet of steam, as if to dissipate the smoke. I watch in a corner as his huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. It's morning, quietly. Sun streams in the window. The black cloud of gas has lifted, and the scorched meadows to the north look as though a black snowstorm has passed over them. I venture from the house. I make my way to a road. No traffic. Here and there a wrecked car, baggage overturned, a blackened skeleton. I push on north. For some reason I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them, and I keep a careful watch. I have seen the Martians feed. Should one of their machines appear over the top of trees, I am ready to fling myself flat on the earth. I come to a chestnut tree. October chestnuts are ripe. I fill my pockets. I must keep alive. Two days I wander in a vague northerly direction through a desolate world. Finally I notice a living creature, a small red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him and wonder, he stares back at me. I believe at that moment the animal and I shared the same emotion, the joy of finding another living being. I push on north. I find dead cows in a brackish field, beyond the charred ruins of a dairy. The silo remains standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse deserted by the sea. Astride the silo perches a weathercock. The arrow points north. Next day I came to a city vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its buildings strangely dwarfed and leveled off, as if a giant hand sliced off its highest towers with a capricious sweep of his hand. I reached the outskirts. I found Newark, undemolished, but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. Presently, with an odd feeling of being watched, I caught sight of something crouching in a doorway. I made a step towards it, and it rose up and became a man. A man, armed with a large knife. Stop! Where did you come from? I come from many places. A long time ago from Princeton. Princeton, huh? 
That's near Grover's Mill. Yes. Grover's Mill. Ha 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 ha. There's no food here. This is my country. All this end of town down to the river. There's only food for one. Which way are you going? I don't know. I guess I'm looking for... for people. What was that? Did you hear something just then? Only a bird. Amazed. A live bird. You get to know that birds have shadows these days. Say, we're in the open here. Let's crawl into this doorway and talk. Have you seen any... Martians? Nah. They've gone over to New York. At night the sky is alive with their lights, just as if people were still living in it. By daylight you can't see them. Five days ago, a couple of them carried something big across the flats from the airport. I believe they're learning how to fly. Fly? Yeah, fly. Then it's all over with humanity. Stranger, there's still you and I. Two of us left. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the greatest country in the world. Those green stars, they're probably falling somewhere every night. They've only lost one machine. There isn't anything to do. We're done. We're licked. Where were you? You're in a uniform. Yeah, what's left of it? I was in the militia, National Guard. That's good. Wasn't any war any more than there's war between men and ants. And we're eatable ants. I found that out. What will they do with us? I've thought it all out. Right now we're caught as we're wanted. The Martian only has to go a few miles to get a crowd on the run. But they won't keep doing that. They'll begin catching us systematic-like, keeping the best and storing us in cages and things. They haven't begun on us yet. Not begun. Not begun? All that's happened so far is because we don't have sense enough to keep quiet. Bothering them with guns and such stuff and losing our heads and rushing off in crowds. Now instead of our rushing round blind, we've got to fix ourselves up. Fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress, done. But if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a million years or so, and no nice little dinners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after, I guess the game's up. And what is there left? Life. That's what. I want to live. Yeah, and so do you. We're not going to be exterminated. And I don't mean to be caught either and tamed and fattened and bred like an ox. What are you going to do? I'm going on. Right under their feet. I got a plan. We men as men are finished. We don't know enough. We got to learn plenty before we've got a chance. And we've got to live and keep free while we learn, see? I've thought it all out, see? Tell me the rest. Well, it isn't all of us that were made for wild beasts, and that's what it's got to be. That's why I watched you. All these little office workers that used to live in these houses, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff to them. They just used to run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running wild to catch their commuter train in the morning for fear they'd get canned if they didn't. Running back at night afraid they won't be in time for dinner. Lives insured and a little invested in case of accidents, and on Sundays worried about the hereafter. The Martians will be a godsend for those guys. Nice roomy cages, good food, careful breeding, no worries. After a week or so chasing about the fields on empty stomachs, they'll come and be glad to be caught. You've thought it all out, haven't you? You bet I have. And that isn't all. These Martians will make pets of some of them. Train them to do tricks. Who knows? Get sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. And some, maybe they'll train to hunt us. No, that's impossible. No human being. Yes, they will. There's men who'll do it gladly. If one of them ever comes after me, why... In the meantime, you and I and others like us. Where are we to live when the Martians own the Earth? I've got it all figured out. We'll live underground. I've been thinking about the sewers. Under New York are miles and miles of them. The main ones are big enough for anybody. Then there's cellars, vaults, underground storerooms, railway tunnels, subways... You begin to see, eh? And we'll get a bunch of strong men together. No weak ones. That rubbish, out. And you meant me to go? Well, I gave you a chance, didn't I? We won't quarrel about that. Go on. 
and we got to make safe places for us to stay in, see, and get all the books we can. Science books. That's where men like you come in, see? We'll raid the museums. We'll even spy on the Martians. It may not be so much we have to learn before. Just imagine this. Four or five of their own fighting machines suddenly start off. Heat rays right and left, and not a Martian in them. Not a Martian in them, but men. Men who have learned the way how. It may even be in our time. Gee, imagine having one of them lovely things with its heat ray wide and free. We'd turn it on Martians. We'd turn it on men. We'd bring everybody down to their knees. That's your plan? You and me, and a few more of us. We'd own the world. I see. Say, what's the matter? Where are you going? Not to your world. Goodbye, stranger. After parting with the artillery man, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel. I entered that silent tube, anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. I reached 14th Street, and there again were black powder and several bodies, and an evil, ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars of some of the houses. I wandered up through the thirties and forties. I stood alone on Times Square. I caught sight of a lean dog running down Seventh Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaws, and a pack of starving mongrels at his heels. He made a wide circle around me, as though he feared I might prove a fresh competitor. I walked up Broadway in the direction of that strange powder, past silent shop windows, displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks, past the Capitol Theatre, silent, dark, past a shooting gallery where a row of empty guns faced an arrested line of wooden ducks. Near Columbus Circle I noticed models of 1939 motor cars in the showrooms facing empty streets. From over the top of the General Motors building I watched a flock of black birds circling in the sky. I hurried on, Suddenly I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine, standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. An insane idea. I rushed recklessly across Columbus Circle and into the park. I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street. From there I could see, standing in a silent row along the mall, nineteen of those great metal titans, their cowls empty their great steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground, and there before my eyes, stark and silent, lay the Martians, with the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in the laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and diseased bacteria against which their systems were unprepared. Slain, after all man's defences had failed, by the humblest thing that God in his wisdom put upon this earth. Before the cylinder fell there was a general persuasion that through all the deep of space no life existed beyond the petty surface of our minute sphere. Now we see further. Dim and wonderful is the vision I have conjured up in my mind of life, spreading slowly from this little seedbed of the solar system throughout the inanimate vastness of sidereal space. But that is a remote dream. It may be that the destruction of the Martians is only a reprieve. To them, and not to us, is the future ordained, perhaps. Strange it now seems to sit in my peaceful study at Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record begun at a deserted farm in Grover's Mill. Strange to see from my window the university spires dim and blue through an April haze. Strange to watch children playing in the streets. Strange to see young people strolling on the green, where the new spring grass heals the last black scars of a bruised earth. Strange to watch the sightseers enter the museum, where the dissembled parts of a Martian machine are kept on public view. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it, bright and clean-cut, hard and silent, 
under the dawn of that last great day. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, out of character to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theatre's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying boo. Starting now we couldn't soap all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night. So we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the CBS. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it, and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian. It's Halloween. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations Coast to Coast have brought you The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, the 17th in its weekly series of dramatic broadcasts featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the air. Next week, we present a dramatization of three famous short stories. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.